specifics of what is involved with that last stage crisis, because that's the one that Steve Bannon seems to have zeroed in on. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think since we're now in it, I think we should all focus on it. Um, you know, you, you should always pay attention to the season you're in, <laughs> you know, particularly when it's one uh, in which uh, history, public history uh, tends to move rapidly. And we are in that season right now. The, the, the crisis season of the, the, the saculum, the sort of, you know, lifetime length period you're talking about is um, is a period in which um, um, institutions are uh, torn down and rebuilt from the ground up, usually under the threat of some um, of some realist uh, uh, his, a sense of historical urgency. You know, uh, uh, there is a sense that the the republic, the empire, the, our, whatever we are politically cannot be sustained, cannot survive unless we make uh, uh, very rapid, very wholesale policy changes, political changes um, uh, in a hurry. And um, these, um, we, we've seen these instances repeatedly um, uh, in, in American history. You know, Bruce Ackerman calls these the, the three constitutional founding moments in U.S. history. Uh, the American Revolution, the Civil War, and, and the New Deal, World War II. But there are others, uh, if you go back even before the American Revolution. And we think there's a similar periodicity in, in other modern societies around the world. Um, I think the deep premise of our book, uh, even going beyond um, you know, what the fourth turning is, is just the very concept of seasonality in history. I think one thing that... Um, we um, modern Westerners uh, tend to be attracted to our theories of history, which which presuppose that history is linear. You know, it's just constant progress. Or for some of us, it's maybe constant decline. But in any case, it's kind of, it goes one direction or the other. Or, or maybe for some, it's just so complex, it is chaotic. There is no pattern at all. And in fact, most academic historians uh, are, uh, take pride in the fact that they look for no patterns in history. Anyone who looks for historical patterns, particularly broad historical patterns, is generally denigrated in the profession of academic historians. It's something that's just unfit, you know, for, for, uh, for, 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 for the scholarly palette. You know, we, we shouldn't even be talking about that. Your yeah. comment about that, that's something I wanted to actually zero in on because this whole, I think the last couple of weeks of news have, has really been started by a historian from MIT named David Kaiser who wrote an article in Time Magazine titled Donald Trump, Stephen Bannon and the Coming Crisis in American National Life. And he actually described you and your co-author, William Strauss of the Fourth Turning as amateur historians. And yet you have a master's degree in history from Yale, and you work in the subject matter daily. I mean, how did you yeah, take well, that? Well, he didn't, uh, you know, I, I know David Kaiser. He's, a, he's, a, he's actually a friend of mine. I, I don't think he meant that in a pejorative way. By amateur, he simply meant that I do not work professionally in academia. You know, I do not, uh, I don't have a tenured uh, <laughs> academic position. That's not what I do for a living. Therefore, I'm an amateur. I, I did not take that in a bad way at all. Um, okay, that's good to establish. Uh, and, and, and I, I will say David Kaiser is actually an example of a professional historian who actually um, uh, speaks very highly uh, of, of what we say. In fact, he, he gave us a, a wonderful review when our first book came out, when our, our uh, fourth turning first came out on the Boston Globe. Um, uh, so he, he's, he's actually been very much a supporter but there are others uh, who, you know, think the whole idea of looking for any kind of patterns uh, or rhythms or cyclicality in history is simply pseudoscience and astrology. You know, you should just never even, it, it just without even looking at it, without even looking at the evidence, they just think, you know, you, you, that that's just something no respectable person should engage in. Now, what I was getting at, though, is that, is that, I say that's when we, when I say about we kind of modern Westerners. I do think that traditional societies, um, uh, pre-modern societies, uh, 
almost always look at history and time, social time as a cyclical phenomenon. And you will see this traditional societies everywhere. Um, Mircea Iliad, the famous philosopher and, and historian of religion, basically says that in traditional societies, no one ever does something for the first time. They simply reenact things <laughs> that ancestors have done, right? Everything is, is looked in terms of reenactment or, or, or repetition, which is a very, very powerful idea in traditional societies. And I think it continues in modern society. We just decide not to look at it. We, did, we decide not to look at, at the seasonality of our own experience. And uh, I think the evidence is, is, you know, just, is just unmistakable. And I think that there are, this isn't like astrology, there are very real social forces that bring about the cyclicality, namely generational aging. Generations that are shaped in their childhood and coming of age moments, in their habits and their, and their behaviors and attitudes in certain ways. Later on, age in a predictable time period later, you know, roughly 40 years later or so, into the senior leaders and parents who in turn shape history. So shaped by history, the same groups later shape history. Very, very fascinating. And there's so much there that we could unpack and discuss. But what I'd like to do then is move directly to what's happening in the news today. To what degree do you personally know Steve Bannon? I think, or at least have you met him? We should at least establish that. Yeah, I, I, I know him. Um, I, I'm not close to him, uh, but I've certainly worked with him on and off uh, for a number of years, on, basically on film projects and creative projects. Um, he is, um, I mean, look, there have been uh, very in-depth feature stories done in major media papers about him. Some, I would say, in, in both The Globe and the, and the New York Times have actually been quite fair. I, I think a very unbiased treatment of him. I think he's, I didn't find anything sort of out of the ordinary about him politically, like most other Americans. Uh, I didn't know what alt-right was until I read about it in the media, right? Right. So, that was kind of my position. I think the main thing people should understand about him, which I think maybe has not been portrayed in the media, is that he's he's not he's not so much a policy person or a um, person with uh, 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 fervent uh, uh, policy or political beliefs. He's he's fundamentally a culture person. He is he is a he has aesthetic sensibilities. He's he's really interested in sort of how socially and culturally Trump's coalition hangs together. And I, I do think that Steve Bannon, along with a few other people on sort of more the conservative side of the spectrum, took took an interesting lesson from the fourth turning. And that is that our prediction that this era would see the successful merging of economic populism and cultural and social conservatism. And I think that new amalgam and the, the, uh, uh, the political um, um, uh, realignment that that would trigger is, is something that they did see in that. And I think that it's something that they ran with it. I will add that it's something that the Democrats could have picked up that football and run with it themselves, right? <laughs> it was, it was there on the field. Anyone could have picked that up and run with it. Uh, but I think in this case, uh, conservatives did. And, and, and maybe I should just add, you know, uh, on this subject that, um, the fourth turning has been used by heavily by both sides of the political spectrum. I mean, it's, it might be useful to remind people that the first huge fan of, of our work back when Generations first came out was Senator Al Gore, uh, who mailed a copy to every member of Congress and was a huge vocal supporter of our work. Uh, and in, in, in that book, when we described the millennial gen, you know, we sort of coined that whole expression and, and began people thinking about this new millennial generation. In our later work, when we really spent a lot of time looking at millennials and who they would be, um, uh, a lot of people on the uh, on the left um, kind of uh, championed that description because 
they saw in our in in how we describe the millennials this sort of um optimistic uh, community minded team playing generation of young people that would that would um work for progressive ideals and move America in a progressive uh, direction and i would say that a lot of the energy around the whole concept of millennials in politics has definitely been on the democratic side uh and not on the republican side and and that's actually i think something that that we were part of fascinating well i know that uh steve bannon has been quoted extensively discussing these basically four great crises that america has had in history the revolution the civil war the great depression world war 2 and he believes that the 2008 financial crisis was really the the next one the big fourth turning that's happened here in american history and he believes that it it's still being worked out to today and i think events obviously uh prove that you know you you you're the one that came up with this what's your take on whether or not he's right or wrong about the the financial crisis of 2008 is could that really be categorized as a fourth turning do you think well it's you know a, an event is not a turning um you know an event happens in a year or so or whatever it's an event uh, a turning is a is a generation long era you know uh there's the great crash of 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 29 and you know black tuesday and black thursday and all that right and then there's the great depression <laughs> and world war 2 so one's an era the other's an event um i i would say that um the in our terminology uh 2008 was and and we said this at the time when 2008 came along that 2008 is it has has become the catalyst that is to say the introductory event the event that kicks off the current fourth turning the current fourth turning is going to have a lot of other events we haven't seen yet right and in my opinion it's going to have things that are potentially um going to bring us a lot uh 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 more volatility uh uh going to be much more um 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 uh, uh catastrophic if you will in its in its implications for markets the economy and our political system than what we've seen and i think obviously with the election of trump um people are beginning to see us drifting further into that vortex right and i i think that's totally aside from Steve Bannon I think that's why people are interested uh in the fourth turning because people sense almost an inexorable quality about it uh and you know fantastic things that that may happen to our um uh to our political system we've never seen before I was just noticing on on Ladbrokes this morning the the London betting site <laughs> did an incredible that you can you can get 47% odds right now that Donald Trump will not survive his four-year presidency. He will either resign or be impeached by the end of it. Well, that, that's that's pretty amazing, right? It sure is. Uh, and and it's particularly amazing and and this is what I kind of struggle with and I'm just actually fascinated by is that we see right now record low realized vol and implied vol in the markets and um uh continuing records being broken all right by by equity markets so how do you put all that together and what the hell is going on right i mean i think you framed it right there really the phrase <laughs> what the hell is going on i think that's that's what a lot of people are asking themselves right now now i think this is the general fear that seems to be out there at least in the mainstream media when they've been addressing this question and i think it's predicated upon this idea that if steve bannon believes the idea that you know that we're in another fourth turning right now that we're in the midst of it then then does that color his decisions as they apply to what president donald trump should do vis-a-vis us foreign policy vis-a-vis refugees to the united states vis-a-vis policy towards immigrants coming into the US from Mexico these sorts of issues and even this idea of some sort of global war against Islam these these sorts of ideas how do you take those disparate ideas and then put them into what you believe as is the direction moving forward for America do you think Bannon's on the right track what's your <clears throat> perception of where he's you know, at I I don't think it really matters um once you understand truly and you see clearly what the options are um I 
it's sort of obvious that you're in the winter of history, right? Uh, and, and let me give you a hypothetical example. What if uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, say, you know, after his second New Deal, after he ran for the presidency for the second time, um, maybe in, in, in 1937, um, well, I, I became convinced that America was in a fourth turning. Would that have changed how he behaved? We do know that, 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 that Roosevelt uh, we know this actually, interestingly, you actually raised the name of David Kaiser, who actually is a diplomatic historian. He's actually written a couple of books about FDR and the f- sort of foreign policy decisions of the 30s. We do know that FDR understood long before most other Americans that it was absolutely inevitable that America would get wrapped up in what was happening in Asia and Europe, right? The, 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 the rise of fascism and the near inevitability of war. He was convinced that there was, we were going to get wrapped up, but he couldn't get too far ahead of the American public. So he would float up periodic trial balloons. But it's clear to me when I read his correspondence and his writing and so on, he knew where everything was going, right? He just knew he couldn't get that much in front of the public on it. So it's kind of an interesting question. One thing we do know is that in fourth turnings, leaders draw energy from that, from that urgency and sense of crisis when people perceive it. And I think that's just one of the realities. Um, uh, when, you know, it's when, it's when, uh, it's when Pearl Harbor happened that America mobilized. And as we all know, that America definitively exited, uh, the, 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 the Great Depression. Um, and, that's simply an attribute of the fourth turning frame of mind and the rediscovery of community and the creative destruction of public institutions. And you remake the world over again. You know, one thing I will say, uh, people are often overly fixated on the negative aspects of fourth turning. You know, they, they think, oh, it's a crisis. You know, that means terrible things happen. But it also means that public institutions are reborn again. Uh, they're, they're rejuvenated. Um, and the whole playing field of wealth and power tips to the young again. I mean, that's something we haven't seen recently in America. And it creates, um, it sort of restarts public time over again. You know, we can, we can create a new order. We can redo our infrastructure a new way, right? We're not sitting there picking our way through all the rights and privileges that have been given to older people. Right now, we can't even, we couldn't even start a huge infrastructure program even if we wanted it, right? I mean, I'm sure you've seen the, the literature coming out on all the review processes and regulations. It's probably impossible, even if we have the money to actually build anything public in America, right? Mm-hmm. So these periods of, of urgency actually allow us to sort of clear the playing, clear the, clear the deck, so to speak, and do something new, uh, and solve large problems that in an earlier era had seemed insoluble. I mean, one of the things that in the, in the early in the Great Recession that seemed insoluble is these whole problems of inadequate aggregate demand and this huge pessimism about secular stagnation. And yes, that, that was the thirties was when that phrase was invented. Um, as well as problems of international chaos and competitive devaluation, things we talk about today. Uh, the fact that every nation could do whatever the hell it wanted. And we they thought there was no answer for that. That's, the future looks so bleak. But by the end of World War II, we created, you know, Bretton Woods and, and the UN and, and, and the World Bank and the IMF. We created this whole global structure a concert of nations and, and basic, a play, uh, basic uh, 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 rules of, of, of the game which, which, with which the entire world prospered peacefully uh, for decades after that. And this, this is one of the good things about fourth turnings. And so I, I, mean to, I mean to say that every season in history is necessary. It's, it may not be what we want, but, but it, it serves a function in a way. Um, you know, to, to, in the parlance of today, it takes us maybe to talk about sort of, uh, you know, the self, 
self-empowerment movements, we would say it's something that takes us out of our comfort zone, right? Um, and, and pushes us forward. So I, I mean, now, and that's not a, that's not a, an endorsement of any particular policy um, or, or it's saying, oh, well, that's for that reason we should be reckless. No, uh, it, when, once you're aware of what's at stake, that's every more reason you need to be very careful about foreign policy. But the fact that we're here and we face all these issues, we have to deal with them one way or another. And uh, and that if things get worse, a leader is going to have to draw new energy uh, amidst uh, the 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 sense of peril is simply something that we've always experienced uh, in a fourth turning. And, and I've told people with regard to Trump, um, I I think that Trump faces sort of a a a a, a bimodal outcome. A, a kind of bimodal distribution of outcomes, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why his his behavior seems so erratic. I think on the one hand, if if the markets stay high and everyone stays energized and and democratic opposition to what he does isn't so bad, maybe he can push through enough stuff so that uh, you know, maybe he can sustain, you know, maybe he can sustain the prosperity or sustain markets, although I think that's a tall order. But I think that that on the other hand, if things really break down and there's a bear market, a really bad bear market, I think given the valuations, it, it could be severe early in his administration, early in his first term. He would draw energy out of that. I think. I think uh, Trump would would glory in a bear market. I think he would love it. I mean, uh, he would go around telling everyone, "This is the feeling of you know corruption leaving our body." You know, and and I wasn't part. Of, I wasn't part of the system that brought us here. Right? He, he was. Um, he was inveighing against uh, Janet Yellen's bubble economy uh, constantly through his. Um, uh, uh, th- uh, uh, through his campaign right up to his election. So he's positioned himself for that. And I think actually with the Dow sinking and with the S&P sinking, he'd be in a much better position to push his policies through a Republican-led Congress, which would know that it's the most unpopular member of that troika, you know, Trump, the Democrats, and Republicans. And they would have no choice but to buckle under and listen to him and do his bidding, particularly at a time, by that time, the public would be demanding action of one sort or another. So I think either way he wins, I think the one way that Trump would fail or it would be the least desirable for him would be something in the middle, right? <laughs> something where the economy kind of, kind of meddles through, um, but... There is general resistance, and um, the 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 Democrats are pretty much effective at admiring them, and 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 you know with with lawsuits and process and filibusters and what else, and keeping them from keeping them from moving forward. And then what that's likely to do is actually lead probably to the idea of a recession closer to the end of his term, which of course. You know, which without having really accomplished anything, I think that would be kind of the worst outcome for him. And, and indeed, I think in that case, there may even be a, a, a possibility, as the, as the London betting markets were saying, that he could leave before his term went over. I mean, let's face it. I mean, he could. Uh, um, he certainly doesn't need it for uh, for for any reason. I mean, I, one wonders. I think people have often wondered why why Trump actually wants to be president. It's, it's not immediately obvious, but but one could uh, imagine a lot of scenarios under which he might just feel better just saying, "Well, I've had enough of this. You know, I think I'll I think I'll leave." But but I think I think that would be worse for him. I think the better scenario would be like Ronald Reagan in his first term. Um, have your really bad bear market early on, right? Push your stuff through Congress under the shadow of that bear market and then get your rebound late in your first term. Interesting. Do uh, something Rahm Emanuel, I think, was the one to uh, never let a crisis go to waste. 
Yeah, and Obama, Obama really did let that crisis go to waste because other than the short term expedience of huge deficit spending and TARP and, and all the rest of the stuff, he really didn't use those first two years to do anything really enduring. Um, and, um, I wonder if he actually regrets that. I don't know. Given his personality, he probably doesn't regret it. Uh, but, but but yes, uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel is correct. Uh, they did waste that. You study society. I think you're probably the perfect person to ask this question to. For the first time, maybe in my lifetime, for sure, I've actually read in more than one place this idea that the U.S. is primed for some sort of civil disturbance or even civil war because the cultural divide in the nation is so wide and so deep. You study these trends, you study generations. Is the U.S. actually that fractured that this sort of antipathy, political fracturing that's been going on between the Republicans and Democrats, could that actually lead to something like that? Or do you think that this is a repairable situation at this point? You know, it's it's look, I mean, on the surface of it, I I would say no, it it. You know, I think like a lot of people, I say, no, it's not that bad, is it? I mean, come on, you know, we, we all get up in the morning and we all go to work and we're all basically decent guys. And, and you know, I mean, so it, it seems hard to take seriously, although it's, it's very instructive uh, to look back on some of the excellent uh, books and histories that have been written of the, uh, of the, you know, 1860, 1859, 1860, and the, the two years, you know, leading into the Civil War. And it's fascinating because, um, right up to the end, no one really realistically thought that actual war would happen. I mean, it just seemed incredible, right? I mean, what? We would actually go to war? <laughs> I mean, and it was, it was interesting. Even after the southern states seceded, they all thought, well, okay, this is kind of a peaceful thing. And the, and the, and the union was the, one of the big issues actually that arose that actually caused the crisis was the fact that everyone thought, well, we could all secede in peace and so forth. And, and Winfield Scott and many of the, the elder generation sort of said, well, you know, let them go in peace. You know, let's not, let's not disturb anything. The catching point were all of the federal institutions in the South, uh, all of the post offices, you know, and, and particularly all the federal forts, uh, you know, around around the coast, and obviously including Fort Sumter, where you had this, um, where you where you had this, uh, you know, West Point trained um, um, uh, officer who who basically said, you know, everyone else just took down their flag and said, okay, we'll give it to the South. <laughs> Well, and everyone was happy, you know, that not a shot was fired. But you had this one West Point trained officer who basically said, no, 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 I, I'm not, I'm not surrendering this thing. Um, you know, I took an oath. <laughs> so, and it made me wonder because I often think, you know, we, we, we joke a little bit about Cal Exit, right? About California, um, and, and California now becoming a, a sanctuary state, you know, not just, not just cities, but, this very aggressive campaign now in California just basically said, well, maybe we should consider, you know, even not paying certain federal taxes and so on. And, and you wonder, and it's the kind of thing where you, you can imagine that everyone would, would think, well, this is kind of a joke or this is maybe very serious. I, I think everyone would take it very seriously, actually, but, but I think the idea of actual conflict would not happen. But then I wonder about, um, about, you know, I don't know. Um, Coronado, uh, Coronado, uh, uh, you know, Naval and, and, and U.S. Marine Corps base out there in San Diego, or, you know, someone's just going to say, well, no, you know, I took an oath. <laughs> I'm not handing this over, right? And, and, and what happens is you just have a spark like that, and then it takes you into some space that you never expected. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. and I, I think that's what you have to worry about. Now, I don't think it's, I don't think we're there. In fact, I would say that I think we moved away from that possibility a bit with, with Trump's victory. Um, I think that the idea of actual, um, uh, violent insurrection of some sort or people being in a more kind of militant mood uh, regarding, uh, the federal government 
would have actually been higher had Hillary been elected, uh, just simply because of the, the temperament of the red zone versus the blue zone. Um, one can imagine, right, um, um, you know, Idaho and Texas and, you know, all the usual suspects being particularly incensed, right, at this point. So I think we actually, and the reason why I, I think it's very clear we took a step back from that is that the particularly industries, uh, the gun industry and the survival industry, uh, whereas in the 48 hours after the Trump victory, when all of the other stock prices went up, stock prices in those industries actually went down. So I take it that expectations were betrayed there, right, in a, in a negative way for, for, the, for those industries. Um, but I do think that in a fourth turning, all of the stressors increase. So it's not just these red zone versus blue zone, which you're referring to, and, and now it's the blue zone, which is starting what they call the resistance and so on. But, but I think that you have to imagine that you're going to see financial market stressors, economic stressors, foreign policy stressors, you know, actually interacting on that divide. And I think that that, that may take a little bit of time. That may take, you know, a few years to, to worsen, perhaps. So it's, it's a mix. And I think that when you see all that mixed together, uh, particularly at a time of greater adversity, then those divisions you talk about could be, uh, uh, could, could really blow up. So in, in your opinion, then, going full circle here, is Steve Bannon the right person to be sitting next to President Trump, given that he really does seem to understand these cycles of history and how they interact? I guess what I'm saying is I don't think it really matters for the people for the people making decisions. They have to make decisions in a practical, worldly way based on the threats that they face. And I guess what I'm suggesting is once you're in the fourth turning, you begin to realize you have no other direction to move anyway. Do you know what I mean? So it's it it doesn't really 